And before we start this morning, I want to draw your attention to this, uh, this beautiful bouquet of flowers. Um, I'm not sure who gave it to the church, but, um, but they did in honor of uh, Anna Grandia, who two years ago this past week um, had lost her life as um, her and her husband had been in a, in a tragic accident. And um, that song made me think of her because she is in the presence of the Lord because of her trust in Jesus. And, uh, and so I just, these flowers will go back to the, um, to the Corielli family, to Anna's parents, and to their home. Just, uh, again, a reminder to us, I think, this morning as well, of the, of the glorious hope that we share because of the gospel. Yeah. You know, uh, this last week, I, I dug out the Bible that I read many times (laughs) through my undergraduate years um, the duct tape you can see has pointed to how well this was loved and used but during that time in my life God's spirit was transforming me shaping me calling me to himself Uh, this was the period in my life where God was speaking to me through this the text the scriptures by the power of his spirit and he was sweeping out dusty corners in my character. He was chopping out habits and attitudes that would be useless, even a hindrance to my call. And now you and I may think of our homes as being, you know, fairly neat, pretty tidy, maybe. But what do you do when you come home and your wife says, hey, there's company coming over in 10 minutes? Uh, Yeah, that means the house wasn't as clean as you thought it was. Now, as we jump back into Matthew's gospel this morning, our Kingdom Come series, we're challenged to look at our lives and the question of readiness for the coming King. Open with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. And I'm going to begin reading right at the beginning of the chapter. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. In those days, John The Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of God. Oh, that's the same. I'm reading the same thing again. (laughs) The next slide. There we go. (laughs) John's clothes, verse 4, were made of camel's hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing their sins. They were baptized by him. In the Jordan River. Imagine for a moment uh, a motorcade carrying royalty or a political leader. You've probably seen something like this on the TV or on the news. So imagine you're at street level. You first see the lights of the police escort reflecting off the nearby buildings and then the crowd begins to move aside as, as the motorcade clears the way for the coming royalty. John's role is like that motorcade. He's getting people ready for the coming king. And that means doing business with God, getting our hearts in right order with him. Repent, John says. And that's a word, it's a beautiful word, that means to change your mind about your life, who is leading it, and to change the direction of where you're heading in your everyday in and out of how you live. And so John's role is to fill full what the book of Isaiah describes. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He's there straightening out the roads, clearing the way for his coming. And so that's what John does. But we need to notice something really significant here. Matthew has already told us back in chapter 1 that Jesus' birth was miraculous. It was a work of the Holy Spirit. And then Matthew makes this incredible claim. Incredible, because as a Jewish person speaking to Jewish hearers, what he says is that Jesus is really God with us, and that is blasphemy, unless it's true. And here again, Matthew makes this incredible claim, a voice of one calling 
in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. And that's in reference to Jesus here, right? Yes. (laughs) Make straight paths for him. Now, on first reading, we might not think, what's so shocking about that statement? Well, this is a direct quote from Isaiah 40, verse 3. It's a, Isaiah 40 is a chapter about God bringing his people back from their exile in Babylon. Here's what we need to see. Let me read it in Isaiah 40, verse 3. Flip there for a moment. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for Adonai. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, what did you just say there, Dave? Um, When I was studying uh, Hebrew through Hebrew University, that's located in Jerusalem, our Jewish teacher, speaking from her Hebrew tradition, would not let us say the divine name when we would read it. When we read the four letters of the divine name, Yod, He, Vav, He, we would say Adonai, which means Lord or Sir. It's kind of a term you can use about humans they would avoid saying the divine name out of just fear and reverence. What if they pronounced it wrong? It was part of the thought here. And so think about it. Matthew says, John is preparing the way for whom? Well, it's Jesus. I mean, that's a totally Sunday school answer, but it's the right one in this case. John is preparing the way for Jesus, and Matthew says he is fulfilling the Isaiah text where the path is for the yod He vav He, the Lord. So how do you say that Jesus is one and the same with Israel's God? That's one way to do it. Essentially, Jesus replaces the referent to yod He vav He. Now, if you're new here, and you're just checking out this whole Christian faith, you might wonder, Like, what's the big deal about Jesus? Like, can't we just talk about God? Way more people in our culture can get behind the idea of God language, but Jesus, I mean, that's kind of in your face, don't you think? Well, here's the implication of what Matthew writes. What Jesus says is what God says. What Jesus does is what God is doing. So when people are chatting away and and, and we say things like this, well, we can't really know God. This text says, well, actually, we can. We look at Jesus. Or if someone argues that we don't really know what, what does God want for us in terms of how we live, in terms of our ethics? Well, we point to Jesus and say, well, actually, there stands Jesus. He is our example. He is God's wisdom embodied, and he teaches us how to live as God wants us to live. And that means we take the words and teaching of Jesus with utter seriousness because in them, we hear the voice of God himself to us. What Jesus says is what God says. What Jesus does is what God does. No wonder we make such a big deal of Jesus. Now notice how the plot thickens in the next section, starting at verse 7. But when he, John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do you think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father? I tell you, out of these stones down here, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax, it's ready at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, here's something we need to see. The religious leaders were coming to where he was baptized. We don't see them actually in the water here, do we? They're there, but they're not really there. They might be there to check out what John is up to, perhaps as a way of either validating or invalidating and judging his ministry. Or maybe they've come because it's seen as the hip thing to do. Everyone seems to be going out to Jesus, so they want to kind of be seen as being a part of that. But John sees through it. He sees through them. Brood of vipers. Wow, that's, that's strong language, John. But it's for good reason. 
of all people, these should be the ones who are quickest to prepare themselves for the coming one. They, after all, have the privilege to be students of the Bible, like professionally. They should be setting the example for the rest of Israel. Instead, they're, they're standing on the shore. So John is, he's not trying to shame them. He's calling them to let their lives show that they're in line with a real change of heart. So here's the warning for them and for us. First, just showing up isn't the same thing as opening up to God's work in us. Real repentance leads to real fruit. The dead branches, they will be burned up. Lip service is just that. It's just your lips. This same thing is not just John the Baptist. You know, that's a bit over the top, right, John? No. Jesus is repeating this all throughout his ministry in the gospel. You'll see that as we go through it. Second, John points particularly to their pride in their religious heritage. Don't think you can say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. God can make stones into his children. The point is this. Each of us is responsible to responding to the living God. Sure, you come from a Christian home or, you know, you went to church when you were younger. That is great. That is a gift. But do you love God? Are you trusting in him? Is his power to heal and forgive you something that you've embraced? Are you submitting to his loving leadership that will utterly transform who you are? Or is God at arm's length? See, the consequence of where you put your trust is real, eternal, and devastating. Or real, eternal, and absolutely life-giving and transformative. It all comes down to where is your trust? Because now John gets back to his work of pointing I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me, one who is more powerful than I, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals or carry them, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork, his his work of kind of clearing away between the wheat and and the husks, it's in his hand even now. And he will gather the wheat into his barn and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John's message is pointing not to himself and what he's doing, but to another beyond himself. One more powerful. He says, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. What he has in store is infinitely better. Better for those who take his life into them. And boy, does he give life gives the Holy Spirit himself. Infinitely greater, yes, and infinitely worse for those who stay stubbornly opposed to God and what he's doing through his son, Jesus. The evil of the world, those who persist in it, who arrogantly resist God's healing and saving son, God is clearing all of that away with his fire. John is announcing judgment. A judgment that is coming with the coming of the king. So be ready, he says. Where is your trust? Here's a couple take-home points. John points ahead and beyond himself to another, to Jesus. And this is a valuable picture for us, isn't it? We've just finished our study on purpose about how each of us is called into a life of ministry That that's what our calling is, is to live a life worthy of the gospel. Life with Jesus means life on mission with Jesus. And for his glory and his namesake. But the truth is, ego, self-centeredness, can creep into any form of ministry. Maybe particularly those upfront and obviously leadership ones. So maybe I'm mostly speaking to those in up-front roles or maybe mostly to myself here. But John the Baptist was not doing what he does for him. Camel hair, 
garments and locusts to eat. He was not in it for the money or for the glory, but more, he's willing to say and do whatever will bring honor to God. See, because it's not about John, his hearers can actually hear what's true, and John is not going to be fussed if people like him at the end of the day or not. See, when we're aimed at making Jesus' glory known, we'll serve people just for their own benefit, not our benefit. When we're after Jesus' glory, our ministry to others will be of real benefit because our concern isn't about how we look, but how he looks. And honestly, that is a breath of fresh air in a narcissistic culture, isn't it? So John, we've seen, is the motorcade. He's clearing the streets. He's preparing the people for this moment when the mighty coming one comes. It's like the announcer at a concert just before the band takes the stage, just before the crash of cymbals and the strum of guitars. There's this building expectation that John has for the coming one, and everybody's waiting and expectant. And then, not what we expect at all. Instead of the full band, just a single, unassuming figure takes the stage. And just with his voice, not the brash kind of song like Freddie Mercury's We Will Rock You, more like Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And then, so unassuming as Matthew puts it, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John is confused. Is this the kingdom come? John is preparing the way for the Lord, for goodness sake. We don't see a war horse and an entourage, just one man. And Galilee I mean, that is not where you expect the powerful to come from. Galilee, I mean, that's not Toronto. It's not even Truro. It's Tumblr Ridge. It's not Vancouver. It's it's Vavenby. (laughs) How could that be? And we and John might expect Jesus to ride straight to Jerusalem and take up and claim his throne. Yes, this is messing with John's head too. And so John, he's sensing a lack of decorum in Jesus' request. And he protests. He said, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus, John can clearly see, has it all backward. But here's what we need to see. And what Jesus will demonstrate in his teaching and his deeds all throughout the rest of the story, Jesus is, from this very first moment of public ministry, enacting what the kingdom come is really like. So we can appreciate John's confusion over Jesus' humble coming. Scholar Leon Morris, he paints the picture for us. Jesus might well have been up there, in front, standing with John. And calling on sinners to repent. Instead he's down here. With the sinners. Affirming his solidarity with them. Making himself one with them in the process of the salvation. That he would in due course accomplish. Now, he's not standing next to John. He's down there. He's in the water with us with all of us who know we need God's saving, healing, forgiving work in us. He comes to be with us, to let us know he's for us, even though in reality he's so high above us in every way. He'll essentially do the same as that when he goes into the homes of the broken, of the sinners, of the tax collectors, of the prostitutes. He is associating with those who are broken, broken and messed up and who know it. And know it didn't look proper for the religious leaders of his day when he did that either. Of course, Jesus had no use, no need for confession and repentance. So why would he be baptized? And that's John's question. It's probably our question as well, right? Jesus tells us, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Amen. Then John consented. But, but, but what does that mean to fulfill all righteousness? 
Jesus is the clean one, the only clean one. And yet he gets into the water with those of us who know we need to be cleansed of our sin, who haven't loved God and others as we were made to, who have put our own selves and our own agendas, our own ego at the center of our lives. Jesus, in this act of getting in the water, I think he pictures here what he will later do at the end of the gospel. On the cross, he will associate with sinful humanity again. And yet more intimately than we can imagine. For he will take all of our sin, all of our unrighteousness, our failure to love God at the center, our failure to love our neighbor, and he takes that into his own body on the cross and it will crush him. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians. God made him, that is Jesus, God the Son, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's this exchange that happens. Every scholar I read pointed to Isaiah 53 as what Jesus is filling full here. Let me read to you verse 12. Isaiah writes, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the sinners. For he bore the sin of many and interceded for sinners. Yes, Jesus is in his act of being baptized, showing that he's participating in God's plan to heal this broken world. He's numbered with the sinners. He gets in the water himself in the place with those who know we need God's forgiveness. And he does it to make a way for them home. One of the things we saw this morning in the baptisms was that Leslie was identifying with Jesus. She was saying, I am united to Christ and I want to demonstrate it outwardly. But, and I think this text shows us, we can associate with Jesus, we become united with him, only because he first associated with us. He became one of us. He actually became sin for us in our place that we could become clean. And here is the glorious result when Jesus is baptized. Listen to verse 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. Jesus' true identity is confirmed in this moment. He really is God's Son. God the Son. The Spirit really is with him, on him, filling him. He really is loved by his father, and his father really is pleased with him. Two points, and then a big take-home. One, we need to see the Trinitarian picture that's being painted here. Jesus, God the Son, is endowed with God the Holy Spirit and confirmed by God the Father. And interestingly, the Spirit is described as being in the form of a dove. What's that about? Well, Where have we heard this language in the biblical story before? Our biblically informed imaginations will lead us back to another story about water, the story of Noah and the flood. There a dove is sent to find out if God's washing clean of creation was complete, if the reset button on creation, creation 2.0, was ready to be re-inhabited. Oh, and our minds should also go back even farther to the very first sentences in the Bible where the description of creation speaks of the Spirit hovering over the waters. The ancient Hebrew imagery here is of a a mother bird hovering over her chicks. The presence of the Spirit showing up in this way as a dove signals the inbreaking of God's new creation work. The promise of kingdom come is coming. And of course, the voice of the father, speaking of his love and delight over her son, this is relationship. The father, the son, and the Holy Spirit 
This relationship has had no beginning and will have no end. So we're giving a glimpse into the relationship that is at the center of all that exists and has always been. And number two, at the end of the gospel, Jesus will command all who sign on to life with him, with God and his kingdom, to be baptized in the name, notice that singular, there's one God, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, remember, Jesus identified with us by getting in the water, and now in baptism, we identify with God's life by getting in the water. But please, we must see. To be baptized in the trifold name, to be immersed in the water, this signals immersion into the dynamic of love that has always existed. The love that is shared by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what our baptism says. It says, I am in that circle of love. And just as God spoke these words over his son, Jesus, his unique son, he says, I love you. I'm well pleased with you. Well, it's almost too wonderful to say out loud. When we put our trust in Jesus' saving work, in what he does for us in the cross and through his resurrection, when we identify with Jesus who exchanges his perfect life for our broken one, God says the same thing. You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. I am very pleased with you. And we think, how could that be? Doesn't God know me? Well, that's exactly the point. He does. Scholar N.T. Wright, he says it right. The whole Christian gospel can be summed up in this point. That when the living God looks at every Christian, every believing Christian, he says to us what he said to Jesus on that day. He sees us not as we are in ourselves, but as we are in Jesus Christ. It sometimes seems impossible, especially to people who have never had this kind of support from their earthly parents, but it's true. God looks at us and says, you are my dear, dear child. I am delighted with you. Again, he who had no sin became sin for us that we would become the righteousness of God. Amen. He can delight in us like he delighted in his son because he gives us the life of his son. Amen, if you've trusted in Jesus, Jesus is now your righteousness. And notice too, God is delighted, God the Father delights in God the Son before Jesus does anything. He hasn't started his ministry yet. And the Father says, I'm delighted with you. I'm well pleased with you. The Father speaks his word of approval over him when he's done zero. There's something really important for us in that. Now, Jesus, he will check his will at the door. Oh, yes, he will. And he teaches us to do the same. We will be called to obey everything Jesus has commanded. Absolutely, we will. As we saw, a changed life must lead to good fruit. But we do so. We live with joyful obedience to Jesus, not to earn God's approval, but because in Jesus it's already ours. And that's not just what I think. That's what Jesus himself says. In Matthew 5, 3, the very first line of the very best sermon ever preached, Jesus announces, blessed. Blessed means you have God's approval. Like a young man, when he goes to her parents and says, can I marry your daughter? What's he seeking? Their blessing, their approval. That's what blessing means here. Approved of by God are those who what? Have always acted appropriately, have basically got their life pretty clean. You can tell. No, that's not who it is. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That could be translated out like this. Blessed are those who recognize they need God. 
Blessed are those who know they can't justify themselves because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just sit with that for a second. If you're in Christ, this is God's word to you. Maybe you need to hear it again. Or maybe for you, you need to put your trust in Jesus for the very first time this morning. Hear it again. You are my beloved daughter. You are my loved son. I'm delighted with you. Not because of your achievements. Not based on your performance. But based on the gift of what Jesus has done on the cross. Here's the big take home. John announces that Jesus will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what Jesus does. How do we live the life that's fully human and fully alive to God and his ways? We look at Jesus. See, Jesus lived his life in his earthly body. Um, Yes, he's fully divine, but he doesn't use that divinity to his own advantage. He actually empties himself and lives as fully human as well, as in he needs the power of the Spirit. Jesus doesn't live differently than what we're asked to live by. He must live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, we get that same Spirit for our life too. We're actually enabled to follow Jesus because of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit's help, we couldn't be the people God is calling us to be. But with the Spirit's help, we actually can. Oh, it might not be perfect. But what God is doing in us is transforming us by his Spirit. And the fire, well, yes, you have to see that too. John challenges the religious leaders not to put on a show, but to really let their lives bear the fruit of that changed heart. Is it dead branches or is it budding fruit? There will be a bonfire for all that isn't lined up with God's design. That warning is real. But so is the promise that John holds out. See, John doesn't give a self-help manual. He points beyond himself to the only real hope, the coming one, and the Holy Spirit who will baptize us and make us able to live the way Jesus calls us to. So do you want a changed life? Actually, do you want one? A yes to Jesus is a yes to the powerful, transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Scholar Michael Wilkins, he puts it like this, change is not only possible, but is the reality of those who experience the new birth and transforming power of the Spirit. John points to the inner life and inner change that will ultimately produce external change. Profession is the external assertion that a person has repented and has received new life, but bearing fruit is the external evidence that the new life is real. Real quick sampling of what that might mean practically for us as we close. Life in the Spirit, through trust in Jesus, will mean, if this is one of your issues, the death of using your anger or your coldness to manipulate others in your life. Life in the Spirit means that has to die. That will have to go. Openness to the Holy Spirit will begin to kill off your self-centeredness and make you into someone who people around you would describe. They'd say, man, that that gal, that guy, they're kind. They're a quick listener, a slow speaker, a a slow to get angry. -er." Life in the Spirit will mean that where you have lust, even just this tiny little piece in your heart, oh, it's so small, you say to yourself, life under the leadership of the Spirit will lead you in those moments of temptation to say, I love Jesus and his way of valuing every person as a beautiful image-bearing creation more than I love my lusting. And your heart will then begin to humanize others. And life in the spirit will grow a generosity in you toward others, even those who are less than kind to you. There'll be a sort of gentle joy, even in the face of criticism. Jesus says, just two pages to the right in his Sermon on the Mount, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
Good fruit comes where the Spirit is welcome and active. We become, starting from hearts open to Jesus, we become new, different. And all of this is infused with gratitude to God that we're living Godward and other loving. See, when we get that, it's all a gift. That we're not on a self-salvation project. We can't justify ourselves. Then we begin to lean wholly on Jesus the one who got into the water next to us, who identifies with our deepest need and then gives us what we need most, a changed heart. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much that you inspired this gospel writer, Matthew, to write these words down in this way. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit is still speaking to us, calling us to look at our own lives and and open them up to you and your work. And we pray now, Lord, that this week, as we are open to your Holy Spirit's working and moving in us, that you would be using us to be that sort of joyful generosity, that loving presence, that faithful witness in our community, faithful witness to the love of God and the good news of Jesus. Empower us for this work now. Amen.